Hi, Owen. Have you seen this incredible footage of, to my knowledge, the only televangelist who ever came clean? This is from Gordon, by the by. It's absolutely fascinating. The tricks he exposes are still used to this very day. Sent a link to me, and it was pretty interesting, actually. I decided to pull the video up and just watch a little bit of it. So I figured we'd just watch a, a minute or two, see what this guy had to say. There's, there's one guy that gets into it so heavy that he's into, he prophesies. And he told me how he did it. He sat right, I mean, he looked right across the table back and forth at me. And, and, and he told me how, you know, how he confiscates money. He says he's on, this station is over 40 states. And uh, he'll go on there and he'll be, get on the radio and he'll say, I know that listening to my little voice tonight, that there's some lady out there and you've got $10 put away in a cookie jar. Now, God spoke to my heart and told me to go and tell you to get that $10 and get it in the mail and send it to me. And God will bless you. God will give you a reward such as you have never known before. And then he comes back to me and he tells me, he says, if you're on the radio and you're going over 40 states and you're on at prime time, you've got thousands of people listening, the chances are that there are at least two or 300 little old ladies who've got a $10 bill in a cookie jar. And so if you even get, you know, if a couple hundred go over and get it and send it to you, that's two grand that you've made just like that that's deeply depraved stuff dude deeply depraved stuff and they're they're doing it to this day same tricks they're using statistics against people they're doing everything they can to line their pockets with money and fleece gullible suckers for every penny they own they've been doing it that way since the beginning this guy i believe was doing his whole thing in the 70s or something or 50s to 70s i believe somewhere in there they're charlatans. They're charlatans. They're snake oil salesmen. I can't say this for every one of them, but I know at least some of them know exactly what they're doing and are intentionally doing it just to flee scullable suckers. I don't know how many of them even believe what they're saying is true. I don't know. We'll, we'll probably never know, but I do know at least some of them are faking, just straight up faking. I want you to get out the largest bill that you have right now. If you believe, if you don't have that much faith, then you shouldn't come down anyhow. Even young people, anyone who wants to come down, if you want to believe for someone in your life, I want you just to give us a $20 bill is the largest bill you got, then I want you to get that out. If it's a 10, I want you to get that out. If it's only a dollar bill, I want you to get that out. But I'm asking you to prove God with whatever the largest offering that you have tonight. You know, you don't you don't get meetings or you don't get booked back unless you have a gimmick. Or as the, the evangelists say, it's a it's a, a ministry. Like the, it's incredible. They'll say, "Oh, brother, so and so, he's got the ministry of laying on of hands, or he's got the ministry of prophecy." But that's that's Perry Stone. I've covered Perry Stone a few times. Gimmick, and the guys that have the gimmicks get the big meetings and do good. And I mean, I used one time. I had a thing where there's a special kind of ink you can buy, and you put it on, and with perspiration, when the salt starts to come out and you start to perspire. Uh, it'll turn red and so I painted a cross, you know, I just did a cross like this on my head and while I was preaching uh, The cross started to show immediately people started nudging each other, you know, and then, of course it started it went away I think after a while it only last so long or I wiped away. I don't remember But afterwards, I mean like I had that whole audience I had one of the biggest meetings that I've ever had because they saw that cross and said, oh brother Marge while you were preaching tonight the cross was over your head I mean that was convinced them, you know that it was really very very real and it made it very easy for me to uh, take offerings it's all snake oil it's all charlatanry it always has been they are only out to separate fools from their money nothing more and you got people like kenneth copeland out there telling them that there are quack cures that can cure them of the flu or whatever else vitamin c take enough vitamin c it'll heal you it is wrong on so many levels if there was a hell if there was a hell, they'd be going to it. I don't think there is. I don't believe for a second that there is. But if the hell that they believe in existed, if the God that they believed in existed, you can bet that they'd be going there. It's absolutely depraved stuff. Not your magazine. The magazine, you show pictures of what you're trying to do, and then you raise dollars for uh, projects, mainly what you... The projects you do, like... They raise money for missionary projects, say, to go to Haiti, but they'll take in tens of thousands of dollars and maybe only spend a few thousand. So you work that as a business. Then you follow up 
uh, from your magazine and your radio you use to build and you go into one or two night crusades and auditoriums. Yeah, this is actually a pretty common trick. Create a nonprofit organization, right? Have yourself elected as a board member or as the president or whatever else. Bring in massive amounts of donations, like tens of millions of dollars from all of your donators, and start paying out as an employee, paying out to yourself. So you're an employee that's paying yourself $500,000 a year. The company's only bringing in $600,000 a year. So the, the other $100,000 is going toward actually running operations and maybe sending a few thousand dollars to actual real aid. It's a money-making scheme. I'm honestly surprised that Donald Trump didn't create this election fund or whatever. Like, he totally could have created this nonprofit and then still funneled all the money to himself. He didn't even bother creating this election fund, as it turns out. He fundraised $250 million or something like that by telling people he was trying to raise money for election integrity, an election integrity fund. He's going to fund lawsuits and stuff. He didn't even create the organization. Didn't even create it. It's just charlatans. They're all charlatans trying to separate gullible fools from their money. That's it. All the way down. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hi, Owen. This is Dorota. As you see, I'm very nervous the second time I'm calling. But I just have a one question for you. Um, it's about the prophecies concerning the end of days from the Bible. I know that uh, Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, talks about uh, Gog and Magog, and Gog will be a man um, attacking Israel from the north. Um, and also the New Testament talks about Gog and Magog, but that has to do something with second coming of Jesus. I don't quite understand that, but I know that the evangelicals talk about it. Uh, so if you could, we'll be, if you will be able to explain those two differences, I would appreciate it. And I love your show. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a really interesting question. Evangelicals do talk about Gog and Magog a lot. There's a weird mention of it in Ezekiel 38, I think, is where Gog and Magog are mentioned. But anyway, every Christian organization or every Christian ideology has their own spin on what Gog and Magog are. Jehovah's Witnesses have their own idea about it. I also noticed you talking about the King of the North and the King of the South. Jehovah's Witnesses have a whole belief about that, too. And they talk about it in one of their newer books, um... I forget the name of it now, but it's about it's a, it's all about the book of Ezekiel. Anyway, let's just read this little section of Wikipedia for a second just to get a little bit of background on it. Gog and Magog appear in the Hebrew Bible and the Quran as individuals, tribes, or lands. In Ezekiel 38, Gog is an individual and Magog is his land. In Genesis 10, Magog is a man and eponymous ancestor of a nation, but no Gog is mentioned. By the time of Revelation 28, Jewish tradition had long since changed Ezekiel's Gog from Magog into Gog and Magog. So it's kind of a confusing thing, and it, it varies from chapter to chapter, book to book, and religious group to religious group. You know, Jews, Muslims, and Christians all have different ideas about what this is. But there is a section here about modern apocalypticism. A lot of people believe this to be like an apocalyptic thing. Thing, like a, an apocalyptic prophecy. George W. Bush tried to convince Jacques Chirac, who was, I believe, the French prime minister at the time when the Iraq war was about to happen, 2002-2003 era. He tried to convince him to go into Iraq with the United States because this was a Gog and Magog situation. He believed that this was like an apocalyptic end of days set of events that he was putting into motion by entering Iraq. George Bush did. Jehovah's Witnesses have different beliefs about who they are 
and who the king of the north and the south are. Right now, I think they've identified the king of the north as Russia because they've been because Jehovah's Witnesses have been persecuted in Russia. But, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses have a bad track record, to say the least, of naming apocalyptic prophetic things and and times probably a bad idea to name any of that stuff for them because it's ended badly every other time they have anyway let's just take a quick glance at this section on wikipedia about modern apocalypticism on gog and magog in the early 19th century some hasidic rabbis identified the french invasion of russia under napoleon as the war of gog and magog but as the century progressed apocalyptic expectations receded as the populace in europe began to adopt an increasingly secular worldview this has not been the case in the united states where a 2002 poll indicated that 59 percent of americans believed the events predicted in the book of revelation would come to pass during the Cold War, the idea that Soviet Russia had the role of Gog gained popularity, since Ezekiel's words describing him as the Prince of Meshech, Rosh Meshech in Hebrew, sounded suspiciously like Russia and Moscow. Even some Russians took up the idea, apparently unconcerned by the implications. Ancestors were found in the Bible, and that was enough. As did Ronald Reagan. God. See, it's permeated our culture for, like, ever. Some post-Cold War millenarians still identify Gog with Russia, but they now tend to stress the allies among Islamic nations, especially Iran. For the most fervent, the countdown to Armageddon began with the return of the Jews to Israel, followed quickly by further signs pointing to the nearness of the battle. Nuclear weapons, European integration, Israel's reunification of Ju Jerusalem in the Six-Day War in 1967 and America's wars in Afghanistan and the Persian Gulf. Yeah, all of these things are deeply significant to apocalypticists in the U.S. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the United Nations is the, the beast described in Revelations with seven heads and ten horns, but a lot of like evangelicals believe it's the European Union, the EU, that joined all the member states together into one big beast. It, it's just ridiculous apocalyptic nonsense. And it's disturbing that they believe this stuff because that means there's a silver lining behind every mushroom cloud in their mind. Really disturbing stuff. Anyway, thank you for the voicemail. Hopefully I gave a little bit of context to it. Hey, I'm Luke from Missouri. Watching one of your clips where Greg Locke said that he was against Eastern mysticism. And I'm, I mean, to me, all of the Abrahamic faiths would also be Eastern mysticism because they're mystical and they're Eastern. But I'm curious what you think as far as how he sees himself and all that. Thanks. Yeah, I don't think there's any nuance with Greg Locke. I think you're viewing this with a nuanced lens, which is good. You know, we should be viewing things with nuanced lenses. But Greg Locke is all black and white. It's all black and white with the guy. He doesn't consider any other possibility he just hears eastern mysticism and thinks to himself that's evil that's witchcraft that's satanism anything that is not christianity as he understands it is satanism and witchcraft even other christians are satanists and witches he believes himself to have the same powers that witches have greg Locke does like the ability to divine information fortune telling and and all of that other stuff the same stuff that he believes that witches can do he just thinks he's getting his power from god and they are getting theirs from satan that's really the only difference for greg Locke. you make a good point christianity is kind of eastern mysticism to some degree right but that nuance just goes right over the dude's head he's it's not even connecting in his head anyway thank you so much for the uh voicemail i appreciate it got like five voicemails before that with him trying to say it the right way so i'm glad he finally got it. i feel like this was the best take personally thanks for the uh, voicemail lou lou says hey man my twitch chat is screwed up but i heard it thank you and love you brother i have lots of problems keeping a running thought for 30 seconds so i appreciate that you're okay with it of course absolutely thank you for the voicemails Hey Owen, my name is Adam. Uh, as a fellow person who suffered religious abuse as a child, how do you deal with the emotions that come with uh, cutting your parents out of your life and uh, just not having them there? Uh, thank you. Bye. 
Yeah, I appreciate the voicemail. It has been an uphill battle. It's been difficult. But I'm sure you know, as well as I do, we had no choice. We had no choice. We had no choice but to go through what we did. If I could have found some way to keep in contact with my family, I would have. But it wasn't an option. And for that reason, I say I'm not strong because I made it through. I'm strong as a result of making it through. When you make it through a tough situation like that, you find some way to adapt, for better or worse. You find some way to cope with it. You'll probably feel like and look like a train wreck coming out the other side after the harmful shit that you had to experience, but you will make it through and you will be stronger as a result. That's kind of my perspective on the whole situation. If I could have found a way to stay in contact, I would have. There's just no way. And I found my way through life without my mom or my dad anyway. So here we are now. I feel like things have gone pretty well. And I can take solace in that fact at the very least. 